think that the general idea is that we start off by posing questions which might be answered by the speakers, but I will say that there's a lot of other people in the room here, so if you have an answer to uh, the question, then please do feel free to jump in. So, is that a question we want to pose first? <laughs> seeing China opening up on some of its uh, sharing uh, information. So it's slow going in many parts of the world, but, uh, but we are seeing changes. Um, as we look at our next decade, then we're absolutely interested in socioeconomic data. And so we'll start, but again, um, we don't collect that. So it would be partnering with institutions that do, and I think um, the hook is going to be the sustainable development goals where you're really going to have to bring the earth conservation and that social economic data to make that progress along sustainable development goals. I may stop there, but the only other thing is uh, at some point, after people here have spoken on that issue, then uh, Bob Chen in the audience from the season uh, worries a lot about social economic data. So it's a good example where there are people in the room Want you to comment on that? Well, just so give a talk on it later. <laughs> right. Okay. Just on the uh, comment from my side, just on the uh, second, um, um, on the second aspect of your uh, comment. Uh, so, so we at DLR are um, participating um, in projects uh, which uh, try to target the gap between social economic research and and um, uh, the, the pure uh, science approach of satellite data. Um, so one aspect which I also mentioned in my talk was the um, combination of environmental information and health data. So we have been conducted several, several projects in that direction. And uh, moreover, uh, we, we intend to participate in the Horizon 2020 activity, uh, going a bit more into that direction. Um, and even uh, building um, responses and, uh, and, and policy uh, strategies uh, built on Earth observation data and transfer the findings of this uh, Earth observation information uh, into policy regulations. It's on. I'm close to it. Make sure you don't have boat open. No, it's, it's it's
sure sometimes it may be some developing countries maybe the level of policy making is not as much sure as other places but the country yeah just to the also to the other continents than Europe and, and North America for instance you, you mentioned Africa and Kenya here and uh, in Fordex as I talked about for the region all these foreign activities was very much about exactly that, to spread information and to produce information also useful for countries in regions where the capacity has not been that good from the beginning. But it's not just about production here, but it's also about capacity building. So we are working quite a lot in, in those frameworks. We're having workshops with scientists from, from countries, for instance, like Kenya and, and, and other developing countries, and, and uh, learning them how to use the data first of all and then to make some, something useful of it, but also to actually produce data themselves. So there is there are being centers built now that we can produce the kind of data. You know, this is one other point um, we'll see into the other responses and that's in uh, Africa. We've just come out of the World Meteorological Organization's Congress where the heads of national meteorological agencies around the world come together. WMO had put together a, a, a resolution just for climate data, broader than sharing of climate data. And of course, GEO wrote, we wrote to all of our member countries supporting that resolution. Uh, the resolution did not, did not pass, and it was largely Africa uh, that came in as a voting block to not uh, support that. And the rationale that was given is that the MET services are making some money by selling data. service may need $70,000 to do <coughs> A, B, and C, uh, but let's not uh, put a barrier up for those other citizens and their government role in the world. So there's still a lot of education that's had to go on in this particular review. Does anybody else have any comments for this particular point? Yes? Please introduce yourself, please. Yeah. Simon Hodgson, Codata. I just wanted to follow up the thing about the Kenyan data policy. I mean, this is a, an area that Codata works in. Last summer in August, we organized a workshop on open science and open data at UNESCO in Kenya. Um, members of a lot of the organizations represented here were, were present. And Fred Matiangi, the Minister of uh, Information and Communication, um, attended that, gave an excellent talk. I don't think we can claim that, you know, I think he was very much converted to the cause, but it was his department that released the open data um, policy in Kenya in February. And they also announced um, the creation of a center um, of excellence in open, in open data at the German Kenya University of Agriculture and Technology. The point of that being um, that it's through those sort of activities, as I think as, as Barbara said, directly engaging with the decision makers in those sort of activities, workshops, seminars, which demonstrate the direct benefits of open data and open science, and help spread the message that a local resource to support those sort of in initiatives will support the science system, will support the science base, and lead to direct um, direct benefits for, for research and the knock on benefits for research.
one of the main roadsets to a lot of uh, interdisciplinary data sharing through concrete use cases and experiences. So we mean, sharing and sharing together and enabling the sharing and sharing what we've done with socioeconomic and scientific data and scientific data. All in the, in the, in the, in the aim of uh, approaching problems of global change. So there are parents coming, but uh, very often these parents are much more easy to, to produce at agency levels than at national levels where the politics becomes extremely complicated. I think by showing use cases and showing good examples, you can convince the politicians or ask the politicians to jump on the bandwagon. I'm sure we as an experience of that. Because in this case, it's also the agency stuff. But again, things like the Belmont don't necessarily address the issues of getting That's a good point, but I think there are also um, there's another message there that uh, increased collaboration among our respective coordinating mechanisms is really important so that we can reinforce some of the messages. So we're just now uh, uh, Future Earth has come in as a participating organization in geo or application. We'd love to get OECD at the table. Uh, CoData is already there, and so One Geology. I mean, there's just um, the WDS, when we looked at the WDS slide in terms of the 120 um, countries, many of the holes that you guys are experiencing are the same exact holes that we've got in GEO. And so I was thinking that we really need to also start reinforcing your messages out there. So for me, it's getting our coordinating mechanisms also working um, more closely together and delivering the same kind of messages that reinforce each other. I think that's right. I think that for many scientists on the ground, floating in this alphabet soup is doing what is very difficult. So we have to get those people on board too. So we really need to make sure that all of the acronyms are saying the same thing. Is there some other question from the floor? Yes. Can you use the microphone? I'm Jenna Lock from the just make a comment on that. Yeah, data quality is a big issue and there's two real challenges there. One is paying for it. I think a good example is from the archaeology data service in the UK, which shifted, shifted its business model essentially from structural funding paid by the arts and humanities data, uh, the, uh, sorry, the arts and humanities research data. Um, if you know any of the uh, UK politics about data services, there was, a, there was an interesting slip up explaining the conversation. Um, so the Arts and Humanities Data Service used to be funded by the appropriate research council directly with the structural grant. They shifted their business model, they were obliged to shift their business model, and now they receive a deposit fee from projects funded by that council. 
that ensures that they get sufficient phones for high quality duration. So that's one possible model. The other issue is the incentives that were was raised earlier. How do we incentivize research groups to ensure that data is being positive to our market? Now, there isn't an easy answer to that, but that's a key area of attention. I think there's two parts of this problem. There's the quality of the data going in, and then there's the quality that is archived, and the quality of maintenance of the data. And part of the issue here is how you do the quality control of the data going in. So as a user of the climate scenarios that CMIC 5 has been put in, quite a lot of that data is it's all there. It's wonderful. It's being curated beautifully, and it's all distributed. But quite a lot of the data that's actually been lodged it just hasn't been quality controlled by the people who are putting it in. This is a big concern. Do you want to? I can quickly comment on that. I mean, we have a similar thing with the regional planning board data as well. And uh, we have been struggling with that for a long time, so many different projects. And it always ends up like that. I mean, you always realize that there are data being erroneous and wrong at, at some point. And, and it's very, very long effort to, 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 uh, to avoid it completely. And I don't think that's really possible. Uh, but I think anybody, uh, the community wise way to try to do this with very strict uh, experiment protocols, etc., that's probably the only way to go about it. But it uh, certainly needs to be stressed already at the time when you set up the experiment and uh, you, when, you, when you get the funding. Uh, but let me just throw out that you know having data available even when it's all wrong at an early stage is actually part of the science process. And in fact, early on in the IPCC process, one of the problems the developing countries had was they couldn't get access to, to early versions of data to provide inputs on how to improve data for developing countries. Because the developed country modelers, with all the models, you know, they don't have the money to make models in the developed countries, you know, they would just kind of model the tropics and other parts uh, as best they, they knew, not that they didn't, but they really had no input from developing uh, scientists who were there yet to be that because, you know, they wanted to get publication quality stuff out for that day before they would release the data. So people didn't have access to it. Early stuff. So, you know, you also don't want to shut off getting uh, some level of data out. So, so, so I think maybe it's not just a question of, of delaying till it's perfect, because that won't happen, but that the data services that we're providing are opportunities for saying, I have identified a problem, and please go back and check, which is not as well developed in the market as kind of the other side. And, and this is essentially a point to um, properly provide metadata about your experiments you ran. So, uh, moreover, the, the scientist who uses the data um, has to be very careful in, in combining some information from sources he doesn't exactly uh, know about. Uh, we, in, in the satellite field, have sometimes the, uh, um, the issue that some data which should not be combined anyhow because the other buildings the data retrieval are so different or um, are concentrating on different aspects uh, so that the data is shared in common. But um, there are still many scientists trying to do it. So it's really important from my point of view to provide media data and provide information to the internet right, or additional information that this data Sea ice, um, one of which is 
seven of which we derived from satellite control sensing. And the people producing that data told the polar bear researchers for a long time, do not use this data. The uncertainties are too great, especially around the um, ice margin. It's too coarse. Do not use these data. The last American Geophysical Union meeting I was at um, last fall, I think I saw three or four posters from polar bear researchers using this data to good effect. They understood they traveled with the uncertainty to the state using this data to good effect. They traveled with the uncertainties. They dealt with it in a way that was applicable to their science. The sea ice guys are too steeped in the details of the data to really understand how it might be applied. So it, it, I think it's it's better to take the risk of making, making the data available and see what can happen than to use quality as a way to restrict. So I don't think we're suggesting that quality is an issue of data restriction or determining how it gets used. And I think Jim's point is not so much about you may not use this data or else. I think it's about the fact that we don't always provide the metadata that people need in order to be able to interpret the data. And we don't always give the uncertainties that are involved. And so people don't know how uncertain it is. I think it really is a caveat for it's up to people to use the data. And we do get some really great stuff out of that. But we do, quality means documentation, metadata, uncertainties, um, being able to check that you've loaded up the right file and not got the wrong latitudes and longitude labeling of this kind of stuff, which are really things that happen. And if we have a community of people who are responding like that, then we can move forward and the quality is improved. But we need to put all of those parts of the puzzle in place. In many of the systems we have, so I think that really is the I agree strongly. I just have to say, let's start using the word puzzle documentation, uncertainties, and things like that. Instead of the fuzzy eye of the whole Yes, that's right. We've got one more. Um, I'm Sue Corbett from INAS. What we do is build basic skills for researchers in developing countries. So I just want to come back to the question of skills building in developing countries. Um, what we find very frequently when we're talking to on the ground researchers, not particularly in climate science, because we're actually quite disciplinary neutral, is that just as there has been for years a real need to build basic skills in research and communication, there is also a very strong felt sense within countries that the base, the most basic um, data generation analysis, kind of my communication skills, also need. One of the first things we can say to us. So here's my question. Who, in the context of climate science, or more generally in this room or outside the room, is in a position themselves or in collaboration to launch some kind of major initiative, multi country initiative, to build skills at a very basic level? In response to that demand that we hear. Well, could everybody put their hands up now or we'll come up with something? If that's a need, then the community will come up with something. So let's talk about Bell, how we Bell that. Bell has, has the intention also to set up a very, very large based training and human capacity development program. It needs to be funded. It's unique, unique courage, unique incentives. It's just going to happen spontaneously. Uh, we're trying to use uh, UNESCO, UNITAR, which is the, the, the training arm of UNESCO, also to try and mobilize them into that. So it has to go through concrete projects with specific aims. That's one way forward. But I think there's also the fact that if there is a demand, there are people who would like to fill that demand. It can also fit into the business model of universities and other institutes. So let's talk about how that happens. Simon, Mark, did you have a comment on this? or? A... I think we were raising our hands in response to your. Oh, right. Okay. That's, so you've got some volunteers. But here's the people to go talk to. But I mean, I, I, I can talk offline for yes. an hour about that. I think that really There's a coffee break, so we can. Okay, so the staff is reminding me we can't have. Whenever we get conversation going, he wants to have coffee. So, okay, but there is coffee outside, and I hope we'll all take these conversations outside. If there are people who've got posters, then can we have them put no, up the wall right. here so that, so that people can come and have a look at your posters either during the coffee break or at the end of the session? 